Good gardening, people. Today is April the 21st. That means that uh, tomorrow is Earth Day. A uh, holiday started back in the 1970s. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's kind of a useless holiday. It celebrates the Earth in the wrong ways. It makes it a political issue instead of something we ought to join hands and find common ground on. Yes, I believe in ecology, but I also believe that you can get there by new methods as well as old. And I'm not talking about solar panels or wind machines or things like that. I'm talking about uh, use of products that we've been developing for over a century. Um, there's nothing wrong with a marriage of the old and the new. That's how you get a perfect union. And speaking of it being April 20th, we talked on the earlier class about date of average last frost. Well, last night here, we had probably the last frost of the season. That's April 19th. That's in this zone, zone five. Now, according to the map here, our average last day is April 2nd. Well, that's a good 18 days later than that. So average only means sometimes it hits in the middle. Every once in a while, it hits on an extreme, which again is why I keep reminding everyone <laughs> No matter how good the weather is, no matter how early it starts warm, don't put out your sensitive plants until Mother's Day. So here we have an example of what happens to a plant if it's sensitive and you leave it outside for a frost. This is a three-year-old uh, pepper plant, Thai pepper. I've nursed it right along winter and summer for some time. As you can see, the whole top of the plant's in pretty bad shape. But look what we have down here at the base. We have new growth. This plant is not dead, but portions of it are. See the top? It's all brown. It's really stiff. What you want to do is get rid of dead wood. So in this case, you just trim off everything all the way down to where the green stuff is growing. And it will come back real pretty this year, despite the fact I foolishly left it out about three weeks ago and it got frosted. Here we have a second pepper plant. You kind of notice there's a bit of a green in the stem still. It's got nothing growing out of the bottom. I already trimmed it once, but a little bit more of it died off, and now it's springing to life. If you look closely, you can see the little green sprouts coming out of the stem. That's what we like to keep last year's stem if it's still alive. But what you want to do is figure out what parts of it are dead and remove those because it costs the plant energy to get rid of dead wood. And we want it to be using the energy to grow new wood. The other thing that doesn't look like it's alive, we cut off of it. In this case, there's a little green up here, but it's kind of dead looking here. I'm gonna give that branch one more chance. The other two branches are showing progress. This last plant got the worst of the damage. So far, it has not yet made any new growth, which is troubling after two weeks. But there is optimism here. Note, the stem is very green. That means it's not dead yet. Maybe dying, it may be recovering. What we do know is it still has a chance, but there's a lot of wood on here that in the last week died back because I cut this back and back when it was uh, originally frosted 
And since then, I've lost several more branches. We're going to take off all the additional dead wood here that we know isn't coming back. Let the plant concentrate on working on the stuff that has a chance. Doesn't matter if you trim it heavy, you trim it all the way to the roots. But we like to have our plant get a thicker stock on it from year to year. And that's a nice thing about peppers. You throw them in a pot, you bring them in in the wintertime, they'll last you for years. And they're hard to start plants. So I like to keep a couple of them around. Two or three of these things make all the peppers I need. Okay, so, so much about being wary of frost. Other things you can do is, if the plant is small, cut a top bottom off of a milk jug and stick it over it at, at night. That'll work down to a certain temperature for a certain length of time. But if the soil gets below 45 degrees, you're gonna have problems. And if the soil freezes, you're gonna have to start over. So keep that in mind, whatever your average last date of frost is, don't you believe that's an actual date? I have been caught so many times saying, oh, it was such a warm March. Oh, it's been such a warm April. I'm going to go ahead and put everything in the ground. It always catches me every single time I try that. So don't try it yourself. Mother's Day, day you can put out all those sensitives in the ground. Before then, you got to haul them back and forth indoors in pots or just wait till then to buy them or whatever. Okay, so our next section, we're going to finish up on bugs a little bit. We talked about them before, but I talked more about how to kill them with different kinds of herbicides and uh, the varieties you're likely to see. Unfortunately, there are thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of varieties of bugs. And we can break them down into two categories, beetles or grubs, suckers or eaters. And uh, beetles are usually adult versions of uh, the grub, but not always. Uh, we also have uh, larvae that could be tiny grubs, like you know maggots and flies, etc. At any rate, in the plant-eating world for insects, uh, both of which are destructive, and we have to fight them both below ground and above ground. Problem is we got to do it without killing our friends. And who are our friends? Well, there are predatory bugs, of course, like the lacewing and the, the uh, um, ladybug, hoverflies, praying mantis, dragonfly, uh, assassin beetle, damson, damsel beetle. All of those are good friendly bugs. Unfortunately, there seems to be a lot more of the unfriendly kind and they find their way to your garden. And the friendly ones take their time to show up. So by the time you start seeing friendly bugs in your garden, your garden is totally overrun with bad bugs. Our bug problem doesn't actually even start in the spring. You can have one indoors all winter long and here is the number one culprit of house plants everywhere. His name the spider mite. It's actually an arachnid, not an insect, closely related to ticks and spiders. But he is tiny. He's about the size of a pin brick. And two of these little suckers in two months can have two million descendants. That's not two of them laying two million eggs, but generationally speaking, their generations are very fast. And they quickly go from just sucking on the leaves, which looks like someone's paint splattered your plant and it's got little polka dots all over them, to building little mini spider mite skyscrapers that are in whole cities on your plants, covered with webs. You look over one day and the plants all shrivel, but it's covered with thousands of tiny spider webs. Those are spider mites. Well, they have one great strength. They can reproduce very prodigiously. But their weakness is you're not going to see many of them outdoors except maybe under the eaves on roses uh, where they're protected from the wind and rain. To a mite, a raindrop is like a whole swimming pool falling down on top of it at once. So it don't like places that are real windy or rainy. 
And if you're going to see a damaged worm outside, that's probably where it is. Easiest way to get rid of them, and also an organic way, take wilt proof, which I've told you about is a tar based, a, a pine tar based surfactant. Mix it with a gallon of water, spray it on the plants every two weeks. The little buggers will stick in place and die, won't be able to move. Okay, we're going to talk about some bad bugs here. On the left here, we have adult scale. Adult scale looks like little tiny barnacles growing on the side of your plant. Usually they cluster starting a, a few on the outer branches until they finally form giant colonies where the wood is withered and just about dead and they're all over. This is the fortress of the insect world. You can spray them all day with the most caustic poison. I bet you couldn't kill these guys with DDT. They are that tough because they're protected with shells around them and they're sucking the sap out from beneath. Now, if they weren't in adult form, imidacloprid would kill them. But once they become adult, they're resistant to most insecticides. So there's only one product that'll kill this bad boy and it's called Safari. And it's $165 a gallon. So you don't want to get scaled. But before you get to this point, you're going to be at this point. See the little vein of the plant that these guys have attached themselves? These guys are tiny too. I mean, they're not much bigger than maybe two or three times the size of that spider mite I showed you. But they look like these weird little amoeba-like things. And that's the baby scale. You can still kill those with imidacloprid by pouring it into the root system of the plant, but you have to wait a month before it takes effect. Do that and you'll save yourself the $165 when they become adults. Or the other alternative is throw the plant away. Unfortunately, this species likes to attack full-size trees, shrubberies, and any kind of other plants you have in your garden. And once you have them, they're bloody difficult to get rid of. One time when I was working in the east, we had a 15-story office building, and I found that all 15 stories, every house plant in the entire building had scale. We spent over 100 grand clearing that place out of plants. And then my bosses stuck the same plants back in there without cleaning up, so they probably got scale too. Not a good idea. Just avoid getting scale, elsewise you will have problems. One of the cousins of scale, who's not quite so bad, is the mealy bug. He even kind of looks like a juvenile scale. He's another sucker. Um, they're a lot easier to kill. You can probably kill them with conventional uh, uh, sprays like uh, cybermethrin or uh, permethrin would work, something that doesn't penetrate the plant. But you do got to spray them. Both this one and the mealy bug tend to make kind of a sticky sap that they put on the plant. And eventually it gets covered with a black mold. So if you see what looks like black mold and you feel sticky, it's either mealy bug or juvenile scale. This fellow right here, the harlequin beetle, is uh, a big pest almost as much in the house as he is outdoors. They like to attack box elder trees, but they have other preferences as well. But in wintertime, if any of them are near your house, they will find some way to get in your house and bug you all winter long. So. If you see harlequin bugs, it's time to get out the cybermethrin and spray it around the doors. And they're probably living off of a plant outside that Okay. Beside him is the potato beetle. Uh 
He's a yellow, black, and uh, white striped compact beetle. He's just about as fat as he is tall or wide and a voracious eater. They reproduce in what seems like the billions. Won't have them one day, they'll look out the next day and they'll be all over your garden. Again, uh, thermatherin would be my recommended spray on the thing if it's a vegetable garden. Below we have Japanese beetle. It has a very fondness for flowers, especially roses. So you'll oftentimes find them only in the, the petals of the flower. And I don't like to spray flowers with any kind of uh, insecticide because you'd kill the bees. So you have to kind of go around and hand pick these out, or you can get a uh, hormone trap, which is a netting that they put uh, reproductive hormone in. But you got to hang those real close to the plant or else the bugs won't smell them and they'll ignore them. This fellow right here, the hornworm, is uh, a caterpillar that I think they based the book Hungry, Hungry Caterpillar after because he certainly lives up to that reputation. The hummingbird moth, which is its parent, beautiful little moth can hover, makes a little buzzy noise. You'd think it was a baby hummingbird if you saw the thing. They lay the eggs to this. And it likes to eat anything green. And it goes from being a tiny worm to a great big, this is actually probably to scale how big the darn things are. They get real big in a couple of days. So if you don't watch your fields every day, they'll be lush and full of leaves. And you go away a couple of days and come back, there won't be a leaf on any of the plants. And there'll be hundreds of these hanging from the branches and they're hard to see because of that green. They look just like a stem. Uh, I find the best way to get rid of them is to go out and hand pick them. But again, you can spray them as well if you want to. They shouldn't be that hard to kill, but they can sneak up on you real fast, a little Dickens. This fellow right here, is a bane if you happen to like uh, pumpkins, cucumbers, squash, or uh, watermelons. The, this is the adult version of it. It's a kind of a moth, a cross between a moth and a fly. They're about maybe three times the size of a house fly. But sometime in June, they seek out at vine plants and they lay their eggs on them. And when their larvae hatch, they dig straight into the vine and start eating their way up. So you'll have this lush, beautiful garden full of vines one day and it will be flat dead the next without any possibility of recovery, which makes them a little difficult to kill because they're not eating the outside of the plant so you can't use it topically. And you don't wanna put poison on the inside of the plant because then you have to eat it. So I don't know what to tell you about squash vine borers, except I find if you wait to plant things like cucumbers and watermelon until after the first couple of weeks in July, when you gotta keep them in pots a lot longer, you'll avoid it that way. Also means you don't get any melons till practically first frost at the end of the season. This little fellow, the slug, is actually a, a mollusk. It's not a bug or an arachnid, closer related to octopus and shellfish, also snails, <coughs> pardon me. These fellows, will appear overnight and like the hornworm, totally decimate leaf crops. Their favorites are cabbages and lettuces, but anything leafy, kale, anything that makes it the main crop is leaf, they will cover that thing by the billions. They reproduce asexually. So they don't need a male and a female, not that they have a shorter reach of partners, but only takes one to create an entire infestation. A product called Sluggo works fantastically. Once spraying, they're gone. They got no protection, they die easy. This right here is a leaf miner. He's kind of hard to kill too because his larva goes into the plant leaf and sandwiches between the outer layers and just tunnels around the leaf making interesting little patterns of death wherever he goes. Well, you can't spray him on the outside because he's protected by the leaf. 
And again, you have the dilemma, do you want to use a, a insecticide that penetrates the plant? Probably not. I'd recommend cutting off all the leaves that you see with this and disposing of them as the best control method. So that kind of concludes our section on insects. I will go over with you again sometime the list of uh, preferred insecticides. I did that last show. I don't want to be too repetitive too soon. A lot of people are starting a lawn this time of year, okay? And I want to give you a few of the do's and don'ts about lawn maintenance in spring. The biggest don't of all times, don't plant seed in sunny areas of the yard in the spring. Not grass seed, not tall fescue, not any kind of seed, bluegrass, whatever your lawn preference is for your area. In full sun, it's going to be a very expensive mistake. All the grass seed companies are busy trying to get you to do that. They're pushing it big time. All the nurseries stock the seed because they know you want to buy it. But if you do it, you're making a big, huge mistake. Why, you say? Well, for one thing, overseeding isn't really a necessity. Overseeding is what you do when you think your lawn is too thin and don't know how to make it thick properly. So you overpopulate the area by putting down seed. But even in bare areas where there's no grass growing at all, you're putting down a juvenile seed at a time of year where roots do not grow. Roots for plants grow in the wintertime if they're perennial. In the spring and summertime, they slow down and stop. The tops of the plants grow. So if you're planting seed in the spring, it's gonna be very shallow rooted. You're gonna to have to water it every day or it's gonna fade and die quickly. So you're gonna have a huge water bill. It's gonna look nice for a while. It's gonna come up like gangbusters and be thick as a carpet in May. And then a long time fungus season. So with fungus season, the products to fix that problem are extremely expensive, usually requiring two different fungicides, probably about a $300 per 5,000 square foot area to treat that. And the fungus will still hang around until such time as the temperature changes enough that it's no longer agreeable to it. Fungus operates best when it's uh, in the 70s and 80s at night and it's wet. So no uh, afternoon watering late. You need to water in the morning or early afternoon and let it dry off before fungus becomes active at night. Fungus is only active in sunny portions of the yard and is especially uh, a problem wherever you have puddling forming in the lawn. So I made up a lawn care calendar for the things you should be doing for every month of the year. Just a real quickie here. January, you don't do anything. You let it be. In zone six, seven, and eight, in February, you put down gallery. Gallery is a pre-emergent that kills all seed. If you're doing that, of course, you can't seed in the spring. But you're not supposed to seed in the spring. You're supposed to seed late August and in September, OK? In zones three, four, and five in March, same thing, put down pre-emergent. This will keep away all the broadleaf weeds and any annual grass weeds like crabgrass that come into your yard. Well, pretty much. In April, you want to put down a fertilizer. And again, we always recommend a uh, slow release granular fertilizer, one that uh, uh, is good for three to six months rather than one to two. Also on April 15th, tax day is crabgrass pre-emergent day. If you put down dimension right around then, you'll have not a spot of crabgrass for the rest of the year. And that's a blessing because it's hard to kill sometimes. Going down our list. In May, you're probably going to be mowing a lot, but that's the time you want to do any patching in the yard. Now you can put down grass seed if it's in a shady part of the yard. 
And by shady, I mean it's still got to get two to three hours of afternoon sunlight directly hitting the ground, but not four or five or six. You want it to be a lesser sunny area. It won't dry out as fast or be as susceptible to burning to death. And even though it's shallow rooted, you have a chance of getting it through the summertime. I still recommend, if possible, seed in the shade in the fall, same time you do uh, your regular grass. Sodding or putting down plugs is the way you want to replace grass in the spring. Put down a roll of sod, I recommend uh, hoeing up the area that you're planning to put down the side, throw down a little manure, rake it in real good, lay the sod out flat. Good sod is two-year-old certified sod. That means it's not been sitting on the shelf just one year. And you can tell the difference because the cheap sod, if you turn it over and pull on the corner a little bit, you'll see a plastic netting inside. Don't buy that kind. One, it's not hardy. Two, later on, if you do an aeration, that plastic mesh will get all caught up in the turbines of the aerator. And the guy who you hired to do the aeration will be really pissed at you because he's going to have to spend hours getting that thing off of there. July. Oh, it's, yeah, I forgot June. Don't forget June. That's when fungus starts. We want to fertilize again. You want to avoid wet nights by, you know, you can't help the rain, but you can avoid watering the lawn just before dark or at dark. Uh, if you have puddling in the yard, it's a good idea to aerate that spot. That'll allow for some drainage. But fungus is really bad in June and uh, it's really hard to cure. July, mostly you're going to see the opposite happen. You're going to see droughts. You're going to have to water in the morning to keep it from dying of, uh, of uh, thirst, but also avoiding wetness at night because that means you're going to get a fungus. So you get both things in July. It's really the worst month. Oh dear, we're running out of time before I had a chance to talk about everything I wanted to talk about. But that's good because we have a, another class tomorrow. So I can finish up talking about lawns. There's a lot to talk about with lawns. You guys are great for coming again. Tell your friends to come watch my tape shows. Good gardening, folks.